All right, so I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. I'm looking sexy. Um, so today I'm going to talk about burn rehab. Um, kind of had a difficult time picking a topic this year. I really wanted to do uh, weightlifting and kids, and that was taken. Um, and then you know, the detriments of sitting around, and you know that was taken. So uh, I actually picked a topic that we really don't get much exposure to. Uh, but it is board relevant, and we do see a lot of these patients over at uh, Temple and Consults. Um, so we'll get started. So just a, a brief outline. We're going to talk about the epidemiology, some of the pathologic manifestations of burns. Can you hear me in the nosebleeds? Okay. Uh, classification, uh, phases of management, uh, the importance of early mobilization, joint protection, and positioning splinting, uh, scarring in the use of pressure garments, and exercise, ambulation, and last but not least, uh, psychosocial adjustment and reintegration into the community. So a little history of um, fire. Uh, fire is a physical entity that's been used since the dawn of time, and there's evidence that uh, fire was used by the ancient Peking man in China back in 250,000 BC. Um, the Neanderthal man, which is pictured on the left, um, was documented as using herbs for treatment. Um, also in Hippocrates' work, there's, uh, in his early text, there's multiple references um, to treatment for, for burn injuries, which were pretty progressive uh, and innovative at that time. Um, and then with the, I guess you could say, common... Uh, scar contractures that were seen, uh, a gentleman by the name of Celsus um, actually documented a surgical procedure for ex excision of these scar contractures in the first century AD. So this guy was way ahead of his time. Um, and in the Byzantine Empire, uh, they described treatment incorporating water immersion therapy. So on to more of the history uh, in 1550 excuse me, 1545, uh, a guy by the name of Ambroise Paris uh, first mentioned splinting of the digits after flexion, uh, excuse me, he mentioned splinting of the digits um, with forced flexion after excision of a scar. Uh, he also warned of flexion contractures of the hand, axilla, arm, and knee. And so um, a surgeon by the name of J.W. Turner um, really applies the position of function. And uh, this was documented multiple times. Um, his documentation included maintaining the most favorable position and the, and the position that is most functional. So he underscored the position of function. So moving on, uh, this is uh, Dr. James Simi. And for all the PCOM alumni, he is the father-in-law of uh, Lister, the father of hand washing, which was actually a question on our, PG, or I guess, uh, first year of medical school uh, exam. It was kind of interesting. Like, who asked father of hand washing on the test? Um, anyway, so he was the first uh, physician to actually create a hospital dedicated to burn patients. Um, his big thing back in the day was all the patients were kind of put together in one big room, and his was isolation of these burn patients in a separate wing to help reduce infection and uh, subsequent comorbidities. So in the 1950s, um, burn injury at that time was very, I guess, lack of a better word, archaic. There was no movement, uh, or minimal movement, I should say, uh, before skin grafting was permitted. A lot of these patients were kept immobile and non-ambulatory until all of their wounds were healed, which is counter to everything we do as physiatrists. Uh, but in 1958, uh, there's a surgeon, he had two publications which were kind of groundbreaking, um, in which he stated, in patients having joint involvement, active motion and physiotherapy should be instituted as soon as possible in order to prevent the loss of increased range of motion gained by the operative procedure. So this was a very swing uh, in thinking and was kind of uh, scoffed at uh, initially. 
So this is Dr. Kipke. Um, he is actually one of the earliest physiatrists uh, who was actively involved in burn care. And this guy was pretty much ahead of his time. So he was the first to advocate range of motion under sedation uh, to decrease the risk of contractures. Um, and he just passed away in 2013. So moving on to the epidemiology, uh, approximately 450,000 burn injuries require medical attention each year. 40,000 of these require hospitalization. Uh, there's approximately 3,500 deaths. Most of these are from the inhalation injury itself. Uh, residential fires are predominantly um, the main cause of these injuries, and cooking fires are about 50%. Uh, so I think just just underscores that if you don't cook, you'll be okay. Um, so most deaths uh, from inhalation injuries are secondary to carbon monoxide poisoning, and also you can get uh, injuries above the glottis, which is secondary to the uh, thermal injury, which can cause mechanical obstruction. Uh, you can also have injuries below the glottis, which are more chemical in nature. So, um, moving on. Um, no surprise here, but 70% of the injuries are in males, as opposed to 30% in females. The main age is 33, and most of the injuries, 90% uh, of them cover less than 10% of the total body surface area. Uh, the good news is 97% of these people survive their hospitalization. However, uh, the very old and the very young have a significantly increased uh, rate of mortality. And as I said before, residential fires, uh, they make up 75% of emissions to burn centers. So as a new dad, this kind of struck me, um, just the epidemiology with kids. It is the number one accidental cause of death in uh, children less than two, second cause in children less than four, and third cause in those less than 18 years old. Um, the most common injury in childhood is a scald injury, and um, devastatingly, 20% of these injuries that children sustained are secondary to abuse or neglect. So moving on to the pathophysiology, I'm not going to really go into depth into this, but just a general overview. Um, so there's a cellular response, um, which is profound and it's been well studied. First you have platelet activation, followed by intense vasoconstriction of the vasculature, and then you get this intense histamine release, which causes vasodilatation and permeability. Um, this causes swelling and rupture of the cells, and it it, it results in this hypermetabolic state, uh, which often is directly proportional to the size of the burn injury itself. So this includes increased oxygen uh, consumption, cardiac output is increased, and core temperature can be affected as well. There's also a systemic uh, response to burn injury, and this is a challenging cascade of events that we really don't have to deal with. It's more the primary and secondary survey, and when they first hit uh, the shock trauma or burn ICU. So a lot of these patients um, have fluid and serum protein loss um, that causes hypovolemia, hypotension. Uh, a lot of them end up hyperventilating, uh, needing mechanical uh, ventilation. And you can have diffuse injury, uh, like an ARDS picture, that, uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, there's alter alteration in cardiac output. Initially, it is slowed and subsequently becomes hyperdynamic. Uh, there's increased, excuse me, increased blood viscosity, so the risk of PE and DVT is increased. And you get gastric dil uh, dilation and ileus, and this is because the mesentery shunts uh, blood away from that area, and so ileus is a, a very big concern and one that should be addressed in acute setting. And then the dreaded most Feared complication is multi-organ system failure. So moving on to the classification of burn injury, there's um, certain clinical criteria um, in which to give a degree or a classification to these burn injuries. And they, they include wound appearance, sensation to pinprick, blanching under pressure, and hair follicle integrity. Um, 
all of the studies I read and all of the texts, they were saying that classification is very difficult because there's varying depth and uniformity, and it's uh, a lot of these injuries, especially electrical injuries, don't have a lot of presentation on the skin, but there can be massive damage internally. Um, the typical appearance of a burn injury is an archery target, where the center is the most affected area, uh, meaning the most damaged tissue, and the periphery being less damaged tissue uh, that's more viable. So the eye of the bullseye is actually uh, commonly referred to as the zone of coagulation necrosis. And this is where, again, you see the greatest destruction and uh, irreversible cell death. So first degree burns, uh, and just to mention the first, second, third, and fourth degree burns is an older nomenclature that's trying to be phased out. However, at, on temple consults, I see it all the time. I think it's an easy way, and it's been tried and true, and uh, I think the new nomenclature is going to take a while for that to kind of be into common practice. Uh, but a first degree burn, it only involves the epidermis. There's erythema. Uh, it blanches with pressure. These wounds are painful, tender, and sore, commonly secondary to sunburn, scald, and flash flames. And they heal in three to six days, as you know, with a sunburn uh, with no scarring. So second degree burn. So these are partial thickness, the new terminology. This involves both the epidermis and superficial dermis. Uh, you get erythema with blisters. These wounds are typically moist and elastic. They bleach with palpation. These are severely painful, um, profound, profound pain. These patients, um, or excuse me, these burns spare the hair follicles and sweat glands. And there's superficial and deep injuries. Uh, superficial tend to heal a little quicker as opposed to the deep injuries, which can take up to two to three weeks to a month. Um, with these, there's minimal to no scarring. And here's a couple examples of second degree burns, uh, more superficial. So on the left, um, you see blisters are present. Um, and then on the right, you can see the pink, uh, painful, wet appearance of the, of the second degree burn. Um, both of these wounds uh, blanch when pressure is applied. And uh, as I said, scarring is usually minimal. So moving on to the deep uh, second degree burn. Um, so these burns can be red or white in, appear in appearance. Uh, they typically appear dry, whereas the uh, superficial appear moist uh, and wet. Uh, and this involves most of the epidermis, excuse me, this involves the entire epidermis and most of the dermis. Uh, sensation can be present, but it's greatly diminished. And blanching is usually sluggish or absent. These often need uh, skin grafting, depending on the total burn surface area. And I should have given a warning. Some of these uh, graphics I'm showing today are pretty um, graphic moving forward. So I'll try to give you a heads up. Um, so moving on to third degree burns. So these are full thickness burns. Uh, these involve the epidermis, and the dermis is destroyed. These are dry, leathery. You see this charred appearance. The skin does not blanch, and there is no sensation to pinprick with these wounds. So surprisingly, a lot of these patients have no pain at all from these. Um, the associated first and second degree wounds that are you know, in close proximity are the ones that are painful. Um, a lot of these, the large areas, most definitely need grafting. And then moving on to fourth degree burn, this is a very old uh, nomenclature, but this just uh, is a way to describe extension through all layers of the skin and uh, involvement of underlying fat, muscle, bone, or even internal organs. So here's a bad picture coming up. Um, so this is a fourth degree burn here. You can see uh, muscle, tendon, and uh, underlying fat involved here. And just to kind of reiterate, the preferred terminology is superficial partial thickness and deep partial thickness. These are both uh, second degree burns. And a full thickness burn is a third degree burn. And you know, slowly over time, I think this will be incorporated. So moving on, uh, the obligatory picture of 
beautiful puppies after some of those pictures. Um, so moving on to the classification of burn injuries. Um, they can be thermal, which are either hot or cold, electrical, chemical, or from radiation. So thermal burns, they're most common. Uh, they can, as I said, be hot or cold. Uh, commonly from residential fires, automobile accidents, space heaters, arson, uh, and electrical malfunction. Cold injuries include frostbite, which of course affect the fingers, ears, nose, and toes. <coughs> um, so electrical burns, this really stuck out to me. Um, these injuries are very, very profound, and they're very misleading uh, on initial primary and secondary surveys. The total burn surface area may not reveal a really bad burn, but the real issue is the massive destruction of internal um, structures. Um, so these are very deep injuries, um, and the current actually passes through the path of least resistance. So this passes through nerves, arteries, veins, and causes a coagulation necrosis. Uh, these injuries may be progressive, uh, have delayed onset, and can be remote from the site of entry or exit of the body. So something that, you know, back to physics, um, current kills and voltage simply determines whether current can enter the body. Um, so these electrical burns are divided into low voltage and high voltage. Low, vo low voltage is less than 1,000 volts, and these usually cannot enter the body, whereas high voltage, greater than 1,000, these overly, easily overcome resistance and are able to enter the body and cause mass destruction. So some um, associated problems with electrical burns include radiculopathy from extreme hyperextension from the wound or uh, from the initial uh, electrical uh, sensation. You can have peripheral neuropathy, cognitive involvement, and interestingly, uh, spinal cord injury. This is really interesting. It's you know, maybe a casual correlation, but I read a lot of documents. You, you, they can present in days to years, and they can be anything from acute transverse myelitis to ALS. Um, a lot of this is debated, uh, but there is um, documented case reports of these, and actually these patients do really, really poorly after uh, a an electrical burn injury with associated spinal cord injury. Uh, you can also see heterotopic bone formation, which for boards is most common uh, at the elbow. And for the life of me, I looked why that is. I am not 100% sure. I'm not sure if anyone after the talk can enlighten me. And with these injuries, uh, a lot of them have cardiopulmonary arrest, uh, which is seen with high voltage. So here's a couple pictures of electrical burns. Uh, the picture on the left is of a hand, and the picture on the right is a torso. So, you know, these don't look that bad in terms of total surface area that's burned. But the real issue is the deeper injuries into nerves, arteries, veins, and, you know, the internal organs that aren't seen, uh, you know, upon presentation, but uh, will need further evaluation as the patient's uh, hospital course progresses. <coughs> So moving on to chemical burns. <laughs> it's a good looking kid. All right. So chemical burns can be from acid or bases. Um, proteins are hydrolyzed, and um, for these wound or for these burns, you need to neutralize uh, the agent itself. If there's insufficient removal, the uh, wound progresses until the uh, reaction is complete or if you're able to neutralize it. So Matt here is just illustrating uh, good irrigation uh, This uh, from a uh, chemical burn. The, oh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> All right, and the, the next type of burn injuries are from uh, radiation burn exposure. These are typically um, in an industrial or occupational setting. Um, the cells most affected are the ones that have high turnover uh, in the GI tract and also in the bone marrow. So moving on to extent of burn injury. <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Cruz does not need to know about this. So <laughs> thinking back to uh, boards, uh, you know, the rules of nine, this is an easy way to estimate the extent of burn injury and can also help with um, planning in terms of grafting and also, interestingly, insurance companies commonly reimburse hospitals based on total burn surface area or the depth of the injury, which I thought was kind of ridiculous. Um, but for the Adam figure, um, there are 11, er excuse me, 11 segments which are divided into 9%, some of these in multiples, um, but the perineum is the one that's 1%, and then it, it's actually um, a different percentage uh, based on the head to body size for children, which I'm not going to get into in this talk. So severity of burns, um, multiple factors come into play here. The age of the patient, very young, very old, high mortality. The extent and depth of the burn, or the total burn surface area, the location of these burns, any associated injuries, the patient's past medical history, uh, any presence of inhalation injury, and kind of to underscore this again, um, electrical burns are very difficult uh, to assess the severity as most of these injuries are internal. So this is a picture of a gentleman with uh, some burns on his back and arm. As you can see, it's hard to determine depth, size, um, and any internal structures that may be affected. So the American Burn Association uh, has a classification for burn severity. Uh, there's minor and moderate, which I'm just going to skip over, but the meat of it is the major burn severity classification. These are the patients that are admitted to burn centers. So if there's greater than 25% of total body surface area of partial thickness or greater than 10% of uh, full thickness, automatic admission to a burn center. As are any injuries to eyes, ears, face, hands, feet, and the perineum. Uh, all electrical burns are admitted. Any suspected airway or inhalation injury. And any injuries with associated fractures or tissue trauma. So. There are three main phases of burn management. Um, the first two we're not really involved with. Uh, we do see those uh, more on the consult side. Uh, but the first phase is the emergent resuscitative effort, which is in the first uh, you know, 48 hours. Fluids, pressures, the whole works. Uh, you know, if they need uh, a peg tube, it's going to be a long admission for nutrition, things like that. And then moving on, it's more the acute medical stay, uh, which is from typically day three to four through when the wounds are healed. And then moving on to our area is the rehabilitation phase. But it should be understood that the rehab phase starts during the uh, resuscitative phase and goes all the way through the patient's lifespan. So moving on to medical and surgical care. Um, the main tenets are to restore skin integrity, function, and appearance. And of utmost importance is to prevent infection. Um, survival, as you know, is related to the prevention of wound contamination. Um, so it's key for us as providers doing consults to um, have proper precautions when seeing these patients. Um, the, other, the other tenant is to decrease pain. Prepare any wounds for grafting, prevent contractures, and to suppress scarring. So moving on to wound healing, just briefly. Um, there's an inflammatory phase with an influx of neutrophils and macrophages, which is followed by a proliferative phase where you get a new matrix with fibroblasts and ingrowing of capillaries. Um, subsequently, there's a maturation phase where the inflammation resolves and you get collagen that's laid down. And then you get this epithelialization of the basement membrane and epidermis. Um, and finally, you have a wound contracture where the open margins are actually brought together by fibroblasts. So moving on to some acute interventions. Uh, escarotomy is a, uh, one that is commonly done. So this is actually an incision through the escar or the inelastic um, mass of charred skin, essentially. Um, these are performed 
for full thickness circumferential burns to the primarily the extremities and or the torso um, as you can get vascular compromise in the extremities and digits or respiratory compromise if uh, this inelastic um, barrier uh, does not allow for a chest excursion. So this is a graphic picture, heads up. Uh, this is escherotomy. Uh, so as you can see, the uh, tough inelastic mass is almost like a shell. Um, they had to cut this patient open. Uh, really, it's just through the escar, and this will help for him to, uh, to, to breathe, essentially. Without this, he would you know, end up being in respiratory distress and intubated. And, I mean, so this is a uh, one option that they can do. So what is the layer that they're cutting down to? So they're cutting down through the escar, which is the burned tissue. And they, from what I read, it's to the uh, first area of viable tissue. So it's not like a fasciotomy. So um, typically, these incisions are not painful because it's, a, it's an insensate scar, scar uh, mass. So other acute in interventions are, uh, are seen from burned-induced compartment syndrome. So in these, you get accumulation of extracellular and extravascular fluid within confined anatomic spaces. Uh, as we all know, the in intra <coughs> intracompartmental pressure increases. You get collapse of the vasculature and lymphatic structures and loss of tissue viability. So these require fasciotomy, which is distinct from the escherotomy. This is actually cutting through fascial layers. Um, after these are done, uh, usually the extremities are elevated and splinted for at least 24 hours. So moving on to excision, uh, early excision of the scar. So as burn medicine, burn medicine has evolved, they realized that uh, excision of these wounds early in the phase improves survival. Uh, it reduces inflammation and reduces infection. So some other treatment options are biologic and synthetic dressings. I'm not really going to go into much detail on these, um, but just to underscore that good local wound care is important during their acute stay, um, and survival, again, is related to prevention of wound contamination. Often the uh, contaminant is from the patient's own flora or from the medical staff who are in and out of the room not wearing gowns and proper uh, precautions. So some of the biologic and synthetic dressings, um, they provide early wound coverage, reduce pain, decrease infection, and limit evaporative fluid loss, which can be significant with these burn patients. So moving on to medical and surgical treatments, um, one that we see a lot at Temple is debridement, and this can be from either mechanical, hydrotherapy, enzymatic, or even surgical. Um, skin grafting is an operative procedure, which I'm not going to go really much into, to be honest. And then the use of pressure garments. These are to be worn 23 hours a day. And these actually limit, um, or they exert pressure on capillaries, reducing blood flow, and they're thereby reducing scar formation. And I'll go more into this uh, a little bit later. So moving on to the meat of it, the, the rehab goals and their rehab stay. Um, some acute goals are to pr promote wound healing, scar suppression, reduce pain, and prevent complications. And the ultimate goal, as we all know, is to achieve optimal function and independence. And in these patients, it can take months to years uh, of treatment. And a lot of these treatments are lifelong throughout the entire lifespan of the patient. Um, so some ongoing goals are to prevent loss of mobility with proper splinting, positioning, assist devices, and orthotics. Uh, the key is to reduce edema with proper positioning and compression, to address range of motion, again, reduce pain, and of utmost importance is to have patient and family involvement throughout the entire treatment process to decrease fear and anxiety with a lot of these uh, therapies. So. Some of the obstacles in rehab are, once again, edema, pain, skin integrity, focal versus global immobility, 
And a big component is a psychosocial component. A lot of these patients are anxious, fearful to get out of bed. They have um, issues with their appearance, uh, warrantedly. Um, and a big component of that is having neuropsych, you know, come in and uh, talk with the patient frequently. So just some general considerations for rehab. Uh, one, the total body surface area involved, the location of the burn, degree of the burn, any evidence of inhalation injury, exposed tendons, type of dressings that are used, the status of grafts, and medications needed for pain. So scarring not only affects uh, appearance, but significantly affects range of motion. Off your phone, Adam. All right. Um, so, sorry. just a couple definitions. So, wound contracture is uh, active movement of a, of the wound edges over the wound surface. Uh, this process is typically completed in a couple weeks. Uh, wound contracture is shrinkage of the scar through the process of collagen remodeling, and we'll go into this a little bit later. So, another issue to be addressed is pain management. Uh, of course, these patients are on PCAs uh, with transition to oral medications. Um, the key for the, the, uh, the, the treating physicians and therapists is to handle these burned areas gently, provide clear exp expectations or explanations to gain the patient's cooperation, to use sterile technique. Um, imaging and breathing techniques can also be incorporated as well as other coping strategies and once again, ongoing patient and family education and support. So early mobilization. Um, so out of bed, early mobilization. Uh, this not only includes the therapist, but also the nursing and ancillary staff. Uh, as we all know, this increases the pulmonary status, decreases time in the ICU, uh, promotes functional independence, and uh, we should address barriers to mobilization, including pain, sedation, and patient refusal. And this also lessens the risk of DVT and PE. So mobility. Uh, mobility is key uh, for, a couple, uh, for a couple reasons. Um, bed mobility, one, for skin integrity. Um, rolling needs to be instituted for dressing changes. And pelvic ele elevation is key for bedpan use. If they have an abdominal or uh, you know thorax wound that makes uh, pelvic elevation difficult, as you all know, it's going to be difficult to use the bedpan. So, um, and then once again, try and trans transfer the patient to the chair if possible. Um, so this is a picture of Ryan <coughs> looking cool. Um, but what is wrong with this picture right here? Very good. That was a softball. <laughs> For Ryan, it's permitted. It's okay. All right, so moving on to uh, joint care and protection. Um, so proper positioning of the patient prevents development of contractures, compression neuropathies, and decubitus ulcers. So the underlying uh, principle of positioning is to keep tissues in an elongated state. Um, patients prefer the, the uh, oh my gosh patients prefer the, a position of comfort uh, which is flexion and adduction um, thought of the, as the uh, like the fetal position um, so just to underscore a position of comfort is a position of contracture <laughs> so once again uh, positioning prevents tissue destruction and um, it's key to help prevent edema, which develops in eight hours and peaks at 36 hours. Something I found really interesting is that failure to reduce edema in the first 48 to 72 hours can uh, result in organized edema components creating a fixed deformity, which was the first time I was aware of that. Um, so moving on to contracture prevention. So definition of a contracture is chronic loss of joint motion due to structural changes in either the muscle, ligaments, or tendons. Um, a lot of these mobilization techniques really require patient education and the understanding 
that these sessions are going to be painful. Uh, this helps to decrease anxiety if the patients <coughs> are explained to, you know, if it's explained what is going to happen. Um, and just to underscore, early range of motion should be employed. Uh, PT and OT evaluations should be done within 24 hours of admission, as should range of motion, which is completely counter to back in the 50s where they immobilized these people with no range of motion, no ambulation, until all the wounds were healed. So common contracture sites are the shoulder, elbow, and knee. With proper splinting, positioning, and range of motion, uh, this can help at the cellular level for better clinical outcome. So scars grow initially, and then they contract. Um, this contraction of scarring uh, continues one to one and a half years until the scar is mature, unless it's met by an opposing force. So this kind of goes into the pressure garment uh, discussion I'll have a little bit later, but 25 millimeters of mercury of pressure uh, can counteract scar contraction, and we'll go into that later. So guidelines to prevent contracture. Um, so this is from Cucurello. Um, so these patients, proper positioning is uh, shoulder abduction to 90 degrees with the shoulder externally rotated, and the forearm should be supinated. Um, the neck should be an extension or hyperextension. And a lot of the pictures I saw uh, with the neck is the neck is completely off the bed and completely hyperextended. Um, there should be straight alignment of the, the uh, thorax. And at the hip, there should be no external rotation or no <coughs> hip flexion. Uh, the knees should be extended. And there should be dorsiflexion of the foot with a 20 degree angle between the lower extremities. So this is kind of what it looks like. If you've been in the burn unit at Temple, um, I've seen this frequently. Um, and it doesn't look that comfortable. So again, common sites are um, burns that involve a skin crease overlying the surface of a joint. So you, these can be seen in the face, anterior neck, uh, the axilla, um, dorsal and palmar aspects of the hand, the popliteal space in the Achilles region, um, and also the dorsal and plantar aspects of the foot, and the lateral trunk and perineum. And the issue with the perineum is um, constriction causing difficulty with urination and other uh, eliminatory issues. So here's some contractures. Uh, this is a patient from India. Um, you can see gross contracture of the axilla with the involvement of the forearm and also the anterior neck. So some more graphic pictures coming. So this is a contracture at the knee. As you can see, it's uh, in a flexed position. Um, this is actually a great paper. They uh, were able to do a surgical procedure, and this patient has pretty much full range of motion now at this leg. Um, here's another picture of a young child with an axillary contracture. And here are a couple of the anterior neck. Um, and these are all toned down. The one, I, there are some really profound uh, pictures I saw online that I hope I never see again. Um, but as you can see, these are not only disfiguring, but they affect eating, activities of daily living, and just being a functional human, which is underscored with these contractions at the hand. So moving on to splinting. So splinting can be utilized for exposed tendons or joints or with patients non-compliant with positioning. Um, the good thing is that these splinting can be done when the patient's sedated and they can be safely applied over fresh skin grafts. Um, it should be noted that splinting should not be performed without mobilization. And I'm going to go through some common uh, splinting devices that are available. The resting hand splint, knee extension splints, um, dorsiflexion splints of the foot, and also axillary splints. So here are some splinting devices. 
On the upper left-hand side is some periorbital, or excuse me, perioral scarring. Um, this is a device to help stretch the uh, skin surrounding the mouth and allow for the patient to be able to eat. Uh, the lady in the middle is an anterior um, neck splint, which helps keep the neck in extension. And then the um, the other two, this one here is a molded face mask, as is this one. And these are more for uh, hypertrophic scarring, and I'll go into that later. So here's an axillary splint. Uh, on the left, this is a uh, one that can be adjusted. And on the right is actually a static uh, splint that uh, cannot be removed. Or can be removed and then reapplied. So splinting the hand is key. Uh, as you all know, we have a lot of functional movement in our hands. Uh, the resting hand splint, uh, it's key to have wrist extension in 20 to 30 degrees. MCP joints should have 70 degrees of flexion. And the PIP and DIP joints should be fully extended. Um, the thumb should be in mid-adduction. So some lower limb splints. Um, on the left is the dorsiflexion tension splint. And on the right is a knee extension splint. And these are both commonly used. So here's a bad picture coming up. Um, so this is hypertrophic scarring. Um, this typically appears in one to three months. Uh, these are red, raised, and rigid scars. Um, and the issue with the body is that it tries to heal the area with collagen, but it's not laid down in a linear, linear fashion. It's this haphazard uh, crossing over, and this is what results. And it results in uh, you know, one appearance and two decrease range of motion and functionality. So, uh, so on to pressure garments. The picture on the uh, upper right there is a gentleman wearing a pressure garment. He's hugging, he's hugging his physician. Um, these are key for limiting scar formation and deformity. Um, the mechanical pressure facilitates the alignment of collagen fibers in a more parallel, normal orientation. Um, as I said multiple times, you need 25 millimeters of mercury, and this is needed to improve collagen orientation in which it exceeds capillary pressure. So this means there's reduced blood flow which is thereby reducing scar formation. Um, the really bad thing, or not bad thing, the unfortunate thing with these is non-compliance. These patients have to wear these 23 hours a day. And if you've worn compression stockings at any point in your life, 25 millimeters of mercury is, can be very uncomfortable. Um, they recommended in most studies 6 to 12 months, but I've seen where patients can wear them years out. Um, and then Kind of going back to this picture here, um, these molded face masks here uh, can help with hypertrophic scarring on the face. Um, they can also be elastic bandages or custom fitted garments that can be used. And these have to be replaced, um, I think they said every two to three months was recommended just because the inherent um, ability for compression just deteriorates over time with these products. So moving on to exercise, um, as we all know, a lot of these long ICU admissions and prolonged admissions in acute care, strength and endurance are compromised. Quoted 3% per day, 22% per week. Um, so the goals here is just to maintain normal range of motion, strength and endurance. If patients are alert, they can participate in active or af active assist <coughs> activities. Um, and the, criti criti can't talk. the critically ill, um, you can do passive range of motion with focus at the end range of motion. And a uh, stretching program uh, guided by the therapist should be instituted. So moving on to the stretching program. So with a burn, uh, the skin is now without contractile elements. Um, so a slow, sustained mechanical stretch to facilitate 
alignment and lengthening of the underlying collagen and other fibers is key. The joint is repeatedly moved slowly to its end range before applying a prolonged stretch. And the prolonged stretch that they recommended was a stretch in which the tissue itself blanches. Um, and then after that, you can back off because of capillary return. So strengthening exercises. So these should begin as soon as the patient can tolerate. Um, of note, there's no exercise or range of motion performed for three days after mesh grafts and five days after sheet grafts, which I did not go into. Um, splints are used to protect the graft site and maintain length. And heterografts, synthetic dressings, and escarotomies, as well as debridement, are not contraindications to exercise. That's probably on boards. Um, so ambulation. Uh, this begins as soon as the patient's condition allows. Of course, this helps with uh, reducing the, the number of lower extremity contractures, endurance problems, and the risk of DBT and PE. Um, there, of note, there should be no lower extremity dependent positioning for five to seven days. This can affect the integrity of the grafts um, and cause uh, subsequent problems. Uh, ACE wraps are commonly instituted, as well as compression stockings to avoid venous pulling. And gait deviations are primarily from the pain, but can also be related to the scarring itself. Um, in autographs, which is removal of skin from one area to the burn site, are a contraindication to ambulation. So moving on to posture abnormalities, uh, you can see scoliosis and kyphosis. Asymmetrical burns to the trunk, pelvis, and shoulder are common. Um, typically, you see shoulder elevation and protraction combined with a forward flexed head and trunk flexion. Um, with lower extremity burns, you get hip and knee flexion contractures, and toe walking may predominate. Uh, with lateral trunk and unilateral burns, these patients tend to side bend to the side of the burn uh, in an effort to reduce pain. And as I mentioned before, aggressive stretching and positioning is critical. So briefly, just touching on nutrition, uh, these patients have a high metabolic drive, and this drive can actually be uh, two to three times that of a quote-unquote normal person. Um, these can be done via PEG, TPN, oral, and other supplementation. Uh, and then instituting a lot of vitamins, which is commonly seen on the consult service for uh, restoration of collagen, fibroblasts, and other um, trace elements that are needed for DNA and uh, RNA synthesis. So neuropathy is also seen. It's typically a peripheral polyneuropathy. These can be uh, secondary to poor positioning in bed or the OR or even bulky dressings that are used throughout their admission. Um, commonly seen in the peroneal, ulnar, brachial plexus, and median distributions. And you can also see uh, chronic illness or critical illness uh, polyneuropathy and critical illness myopathy, which I'm not going to get into in this discussion. So amputations. Uh, interestingly, low voltage typically only affects the toes and fingers, whereas high voltage affects the upper and lower limbs. Uh, with electrical, it's usually immediate versus thermal injuries, which is delayed, where the amputation is done at a later date, uh, either due to non-viable tissue, life-threatening sepsis, or a limb that's non-functional or insensate. And most of these patients survive and become successful prosthetic users. So another area that we should be aware of is sleep disturbance. Um, not only in the ICU, but here at Moss, frequent awakenings. Um, really, uh, there's a lot of literature on this, with, uh, for predominantly in the ICU, limiting nighttime interruptions, because these patients end up having uh, more pain meds needed if their uh, sleep is disturbed often. Um, and interestingly, hospital insomnia is associated with worse pain after hospital discharge. 
Um, I was at one of my interviews, and there was an ICU anesthesiologist who had a whole talk on this. And it, uh, there's a lot of literature and uh, things that are be, being instituted to help redu reduce these uh, disturbances, and uh, subsequently these patients are having less pain, uh, significant pain that was previously at time of discharge. So, and um, these sleep disturbances can commonly last months. So a big uh, component of the burn injury is the psychosocial adjustment. Um, these patients um, are, can be profoundly disfigured. I uh, saw a patient on Temple Consults who lit herself on fire, and I really couldn't tell she was a human. I saw her eyes and her mouth, and that was about it. Um, so, you know, they have obstacles and issues, uh, including depression, anxiety. A lot of these patients deal with PTSD, uh, up to 45% of them. Um, so it's key that we have, uh, you know, our resources here and have psychology frequently see these patients. I know we don't see a lot of burn patients here, uh, but just to, on the consult service, uh, you know, that needs to be recommended. Um, and there can be severe loss of personal identity. I mean, we all get up every day and look at ourselves in the mirror and say, yeah, I look like a million bucks. Or, ah, I've got a zit on my face and this and that. So, um, you know, it's a big part of who we are. And uh, I think that process is profound and one that I don't begin to think to understand. So uh, there is a component of survivor guilt if, you know, other people passed away in the fire and they're living and... Um, you know, a lot of that can be uh, a lifelong issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so the treatment options, of course, are medications, counseling, uh, and the key is early reintegration into the community. There's a lot of support groups. Uh, there's strength in numbers, as we all know. Um, the world can be a very cruel place, but these people are able to find a common ground, and uh, I think that facilitates a better recovery mentally and also encourages them to continue their uh, therapy on an outpatient basis. And of course as providers we need to be sensitive to the emotional and psychological needs of not only these patients but their families. This is a very traumatic event for everyone involved. So some of the uh, take-home points. Uh, we discussed the pathologic manifestations of burn injury went over the burn injury classification, the different types of burns, underscored the importance of early mobilization, joint protection, and splinting, uh, went over some pressure garments and how often they should be worn and how they help with hypertrophic scarring, um, and underscored uh, the need for exercise, ambulation, and range of motion starting on day one of admission. Um, and also, psychosocial adjustment and reintegration. And, you know, a big part of doing this talk was I uh, had consults twice this year, and I would go over and see a burn patient. I'm like, okay. I had, I, besides writing Let the Wounds Heal, I had no recommendations, meaningful recommendations to give these teams. Um, and I know the therapists are very skilled and know what to do, but I think this is good just for everybody. I didn't know anything coming in, and I think... Uh, it gave me some pointers, not only for board relevant material, those five questions that you, all the fourth years should get right now. And um, yeah, so, all right. Well, thank you to Dr. Mullen for breakfast, and Dr. Galgun, my advisor. That's my little girl Violet and my wife Tiffany, and uh, that's our new little baby we're expecting in November. So. With that, I will end my talk. Any questions? I read anywhere from 20 to 23 hours a day. You know, I don't because it, it depends on... Uh, one, the severity of the burns, and then the treating team, any associated, uh, you know, traumatic fractures or anything else. So, yeah. 
Well, I think a lot of the splinting they do use after skin grafting is to augment um, one range of motion that's been established after surgery so you don't lose that and then also to kind of protect the wounds because I, I thought wow this you know splinting is gonna affect the wound but if it's done properly it displaces the force correctly so the wound isn't affected. Was that uh, Uh, I know in Cucurello, it's it's noted as in all burns, but the studies that I saw, it was electrical burns. Um, there was like a case report of 47 or 50 people, and the incidence was, out of all those patients, 3%, but they were all in the elbow. There were no other joints affected, so... Mm -hmm. It's always people's fault, right? So, uh, spinal cord is always going to be the lower than the lesion, which is usually the legs, and the big base in the joints of the leg. Yeah. Later on, it's the hips first, and then the shoulders and the kind of thing happen. With electrical burns, uh, most people are doing those. Not like you can start by lighting your hand or yeah. you can do electric bonds, but touching high level wires would <laughs> work, and, you know, live circuits in your hands. Yeah, and yeah. Surges through, so. Yeah, definitely. And you know, that's something I need to dig into more. And I, I did try, and there was just no, uh, you know, consensus as to why. So. I mean, you know, flash birds, people cover their face, they have defensive arms. Yeah. Flash birds are touching, they're locked on, holding someone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the chemical birds are working with their hands. So it's always kind of the upper extremity. I'm not surprised. Yeah, makes sense. So, my, my biggest frustration with these patients in the rehab setting is that uh, I never really know when they're done. You know, um, I feel like it's just a very slow course. Are there any kind of recommendations in terms of uh, how to know what their new goal is or, or when when to discharge? Uh, you know. You know I did not see that, and I think the uh, the therapist who's speaking over the next two hours, I think he can probably give a better indication because they deal with uh, are they ready to be discharged, the whole you know team conference, and I just don't have that experience to know what the thought process and if if there is a threshold they cross to say, you know they're appropriate to be discharged at home. So, did you see anything about like him changes? Yeah. I did not look at that specifically. So. <laughs> Anywhere. From what I read, it's any autograft on the lower extremity is contraindicated for ambulation. So outside of autographs, uh, contraindication, were there any other contraindications to mobilization? I know you gave a list of things that weren't but was there any obvious like they can't move, they shouldn't move contraindications? No, and that's the thing is it, it underscores that these patients should be moving and therapy should be the, the day that they're admitted doing active range of motion, which I was shocked by. Because, you know, you're like, oh, don't, you know, it hurts this and that. But the key is to get things moving sooner than later um, and incorporating this. Whereas, in the, you know, in the past, they really waited in a lot of this changes at the cellular level and scarring and you know other things just really were kind of past the point of early uh, mobilization. And the nice thing is that they can do a lot of it under anesthesia, which is great. So 